glory to God. I want to welcome you to another hour of our study of outreach. We've been looking at outreach for, I think this is our fourth hour together, a fourth lesson. And we've been looking at outreach from a perspective that I think true outreach uh, can be obtained, that the desire for outreach can be realized, the, the real reason for outreach can be demonstrated in and through the church. Why we're reaching out to others. When we use the word outreach, it really means just to reach out to others. But we've been looking at this from, I think, a very mature perspective, looking at it as a child of God who's matured to the point that they want to be that co-laborer with God in the work of the ministry. And the ministry is to go out and let the world know how much God loves them and the price that he paid for them. We ended in our last hour, and we're going to start up right back there again in uh, 1 John chapter 4. And we're going to leave there and go back to the uh, Second Peter chapter 1 because we're talking about how this outreach as we reach out to others and show them the love of God this will cause them enable them this will enable them to make the changes in their lives that we see that they need and that they desire and we don't do it by scaring them into it. We do it by showing them the goodness of God. We saw in Romans chapter 2 verse 4 that it's the goodness of God that leads men to repent. And that verse starts off asking the question, do you despise this? You want God to punish them? That's what it's talking about. There are those that want hellfire and brimstone. Well, God's going to get you. We don't serve a God's going to get you God. We serve a God that loves us, that sent his son to prove his love for us, to show his love for us, to put us in a position that if we desire, we can be made righteous of God. He doesn't force us to receive his gift. But he offers it up to us freely. And we just receive it. Just receive it. Receive God's love. You can't buy it. You can't bribe him. It's nothing you have to do but receive it. Now after you receive it, you want to have some evidence in your own life that you have received it. You should see changes in your life, changes in your heart, changes in your desires. You'll know whether or not you've changed because the change comes from the inside before it's demonstrated on the outside. You might still be doing some of the things that you did before you were saved. More than likely you are. Not only doing some of them, you might be doing all of them. But on the inside, there has been a change if you've been born again. We have to learn how to live according to what God has done in us through Christ Jesus, through his living word. We have to learn that. That's why the word of God tells us, desire the sincere milk of the word that you might grow thereby. And as you grow in the things of God, grow in the knowledge of God, the scriptures tell us, and this is what we're going to look at in 2 Peter, that this will cause the changes in life that you want. It will cause the changes for you. And as you see the, the change in your own life, now you're in a position to do what Jesus told us to do, and that's to go out into all the world and teach them. Show them. Demonstrate to them. Be a witness 
that there is a God, a living God, a true and living God in the world. Say, how do you know? Because you know the change that's in you. You don't need someone else to tell you. You know. Not by your actions on the outside. Like I said before, it might take a while for those actions to change, but now you have, if nothing else, no other way to describe it, you have a consciousness of God's love for you. And the changes will come about as you get the knowledge of him. So let's go back to, where were we? First John chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. It says, in this was manifested, the verse 9 says, in this was manifested the love of God to us. This, this word manifested, it means in this was shown. This is how we see. This is how it was displayed. This is how we could observe it. Not just something that was being talked about, but this is how we could see it was manifested. We could see it. We could observe it. We could understand, start to understand at least. Hey, God really loves us. He loves me. He loves you, and he loves you individually. He knows you. He died for you. It says, in this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love. This is the definition of love. That's what that's saying when it says herein is love. It's saying this is the definition of love. And the first thing God does when he says this is the definition of love, he tells us what love is not. He says herein is love, not that we loved God. That is not love. Man's love is always based on what can be done for him. I love my car because of the prestige it gives me. I love my car because of the smoothness of the ride. I love my cat because it makes me so comforting to just sit there and feel this purr, or hearing purring. And I love my dog because he's so loyal. And I love this and I love that. It's always based on something personal. What God, what can be done for me. God said right off, I'm going to give you the definition of love. Here's the definition of love. First thing I want you to know is, it's not that you love me. Don't be mistaken in the thinking that that is love. That is not love. You'll kill the cat, you'll kill the dog, you'll sell the car. That is not love. And then he goes on to tell us what love is. He says, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. He sent his, sent his son to pay the price, to be the sacrifice for our sins. He didn't just say it in words. He didn't just give us some words that says this is a, a, a something you should feel good about. Me telling you that I love you. Wouldn't that been enough? He's not a man that he should lie. This shows you the awesome uh, horror of sin. To redeem us, to get us back to where he could, where we would be in a place to spend all of eternity with him the way he wanted us to from the time he created man. It took the blood of his son Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. It took the blood of his son to cleanse us, to be the sacrifice for our sins. So he proved to us that he loves us. Now how can we prove to him that we love him? How do we do that? What he said. Through obedience. He said, Jesus said, and he asked his disciples, he said, why do you say you love me? And you don't do what I tell you to do. 
This is the way we show love to him is through our obedience to his word. To him. To be obedient to him is to be obedient to his word. Now, one of his words that's so awesome, this is what we're studying is outreach. He said, if you love me, you'll do what I say. And what I'm saying to you now is to go into all the world and make disciples, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. So we have a way of testing ourselves to see that's what the scripture says, test yourself to see if we are of the faith. If we're in the faith, we have a way of testing us. Am I doing what God told me to do? How do I know what he told me to do? By going to his word, by studying his word, by seeking him through prayer, through obedience. Now, while we're here in 1st John, we're going to go over to verse to uh, verse 16. It says, And we have known and believed the love that God had to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. Here's the challenge that Satan presents to mankind is the challenge to believe that God actually loves us and loves us individually. Not just some poetic saying, but God actually loves us. God said, I have proven to you, I have shown you what love is, I sacrifice my only begotten son for you. I did that. Now, you're in a position, we're in a position to believe it or not believe it. The scripture says we have known and believed the love that God has for us. Right believing will cause right actions. You start trying to change your actions and you don't believe God loves you, you're going to operate in fear, fear of loss, fear of lack. And, and this is what causes people to do things. This people, a person thinks they don't have enough money, so they steal. They're in fear. It's a fear that causes that to happen to them. They start to fear God. They know they're not doing right, and so Satan brings attacks against them and against their family and against their health, and Satan tells them that God did this to them or is doing this to them because God is angry with them and God knows them and God doesn't like ugly and all of these things that, that Satan brings up and when people receive and accept the fact that they're sick and, they're, and they don't believe that God loved them and that God put their sicknesses on Jesus so they receive it. They receive the attack. They'll go out and steal, and they'll go out and murder, and they'll do all, all these things because they're afraid, they're frightened, they're scared of God, they're scared in life, they don't even know why they're, they're living in terror, terror by day and terror by night, all because we, the church, have failed to reach them, to let them know God loves them. This is what we're to reach out and share with others. God's love. This is not about building a bigger church. This is not about soul winning for the sake of saying, we got more souls, we've won more souls than they won. Did you show them the love of God? Did you teach them? Did you tell them about how much God loves them? So that they will walk free of fear and terror so that they will be in a position to be obedient so that they won't be deceived by feelings so that they can know that they know that they know that they know that God loves them. No matter what's going on in their lives, what has gone on, and, and no matter what they might 
be confronted with in the future. They have a solid foundation. They're rooted and grounded in God's love for them. This is what we're to reach out to people with. Listen to the blessing of this. It says, verse 16, And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. He that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein, here's the definition again, herein is our love made perfect, made complete, made mature. This is the way we make our love complete. This is the way we make our love mature, a mature love. The love of a mature child, one that has grown to a point of loving God so much that they want to go out and let others, they want to reach out and let others know how much God loves them. So they can free other people from the terror that they live in daily. It says, herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. How is Jesus now? It doesn't say, as he is, so we will be. It says, as he is, so we are. Is he healed? Then I'm healed. Then you're healed. You're healed. As he is, so are we. That's why he goes on, he says, Beloved, now are we the children of God. We're not going to be. We're his children now. We've been adopted into his family, made members of his household, citizens of the kingdom of God. We were born again in the citizenship. We were adopted in love into his family. We weren't born into his family. We were adopted into his family. We were born in his kingdom, into his kingdom. There are no, no, what do they call that uh, citizen, naturalized citizens? There are no naturalized citizens in the kingdom of God. You have to be born in his kingdom. And you're adopted into his family. Think we're born into the family? I hear all of this teaching. I'm saying, oh, it would be so great if people would just take the scriptures of what they say. You don't have to adopt your children that are born into your family, do you? Yes. That's why we have the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, Father. Satan's the love, yes. Before you saw the distinction between being born into the kingdom. That they're what the distinction was, yeah. And that's why we study. And that's why he's saying you, we can see all of these things and it's through the knowledge of these things that we study and find that our lives are changed. We'll see that in Peter. It's not through hellfire and damnation. Don't go out teaching anyone that God's going to get them. If God was going to get us, we'd have been God. God loves us and we get a chance to come to him freely. Yes. Yeah, he brings it, says it in Corinthians. He uses absolutely nothing to get rid of things that exist. You say, what's God going to do about that? You can say nothing. He doesn't have to do anything. Because he uses nothing to bring to nothing. The scripture, if you were to, 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 to really break that down, he says, he uses nothing that is in existence to bring to non-existence things that are in existence. That's the power of our God. He would have no problem with us if he wanted to destroy us or do something with us. His challenge was to get us to believe that he loves us. 
And he did it in a way that no one can refute. He did it by giving up his only begotten son for us. You have two things that you love and you value. Which one do you sacrifice for the other? What an awesome price in the eyes of God. We are of great value. We cost him his son. And Satan never wants us to realize the value that God has placed on us. And what lengths he went to to show us his love. Where were we? He said, it said, uh, Verse 17, herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in the world. We can come boldly, that's what he says, come boldly to the throne of grace and obtain grace and mercy in a time of need, to help in a time of need. We don't have to come in dragging an old dead cow, making a sacrifice. Oh Lord, I humbly beseech you. So he said, come on boldly, Father, 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 Daddy, Daddy. We don't ask our children to make a formal appointment with us. Oh, yes, I'll see you next Tuesday. I have five minutes after dinner. We're the children of God. He has adopted us. He loves us. He says, come boldly. I'm quite sure if the President of the United States or the King of some country is in a council and they have a small child and that child runs into the room hollering, Daddy, Daddy, they're going to get audience immediately with their father. And we think we have to get in line to come to God. We have to line our life up. That's nonsense, church. He's our Father. He loves us. He gave His Son for us to prove it. And Jesus told us, our Lord and our Savior told, told us, He said, God loves you as much as He loves me. What an awesome thing to think. It takes a mature mind to start to even meditate on and concede the love that God has for us. Let me finish reading this. It says in verse 18, There is no fear in love, but perfect love or mature love casts out fear because fear has torment. He that feareth is not made perfect or mature in love. What are you afraid of? What are you fearing? It's telling you if you're fearing it, you don't understand the love of God. You know, I've taken, and just as a way of illustration, I've, I've asked groups, been in groups, and asked them before, it says, if, if you're sick, and, and uh, you can't seem to find a healing or cure for what's your sickness, I say, what's the worst thing that can happen to you? What do you think the most common answer is? That's the most common answer, is you die. The question was, what's the worst thing that could happen to you? The answer most commonly given is die. No, that's not the answer. <laughs> the answer is die. If you're a child of God, that's the best thing that could happen to you. Because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And if we believe the scriptures, it's not a little better. It is far better to leave this body and to be with the Lord than it is to stay here. So what happens when you start to believe the love of God, you don't fear death. That's why it says we've been set free from the fear of death which held us bondage all of our lives when we were in the world. This is what you're to reach out and tell people. They're in fear. They're in fear of loss of this and loss of that. They're in fear of dying. And if we in the church still think that dying is the worst thing that could happen to you, 
We've not been made perfect in the mature love of God. We haven't understood. Why would we fear being with the Lord? When we think these things, it's like, to me, it's like taking a big spotlight and shining it into a little dark room. All of a sudden you say, how can I think that? Why, why would I why, why would I think that dying would be bad if dying means I go be with the Lord? Why am I thinking that way? Am I fearing God? Am I really saved? Do I really believe? Doesn't the scripture say who were held captive all their lives through the fear of death? Captive to Satan. How? Out of the fear of death. And here I am, a child of God, and I'm still fearing death. I am. I'm still being held captive. This is why we want to grow up in the things of God so that we can share the love of God so that we can take others to the point that they not only know the love of God, they believe it. And it's through the knowledge of God that we can gain a belief. We can't believe in something you have no knowledge of, can you? No, you can't. It's impossible. So, now I want to read that again. There is no fear in love. There's no what? Fear in love. No fear in love. How much fear is there in love? Zero. Zero. If you know God loves you, you don't have to fear anything. What's the worst can happen to you? Now, no one knows how to answer that question. <laughs> What's the worst that could happen to you? <laughs> we really don't have an answer, do we? What, what, what were we fearing? What is there to fear? What are we afraid of? In any situation. Pain, discomfort. You fear the pain and you fear the discomfort and you fear the embarrassment. Yeah. And God, you know what God calls that? Pride. This light momentary affliction. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he, said it's, it's, he, said, he said, there is no comparison to the glory that is in store for us. But still, pain can be a horrible thing. Yep, always oh, some horrible things that happen to people. But do we have to fear? No, we don't. No, we don't. See, we don't, you know, we don't, we have enough, <coughs> we have enough testimonies <coughs> of people that have gone through some really horrible things. And the testimony is that the Lord separated them from what was going on. Where they stood to the side and watched themselves go through what they were going through, but they weren't going through it. Is there enough testimony of that? I believe it. I believe it. the Lord, and I have had some experience with that while I was ministering. And I know other ministers that have. I imagine people other than ministers have. You ever heard the term beside yourself? He was beside himself. I have been ministering, and I'm facing a group that I'm ministering to. And then while facing the group ministering to them, 
there was another me besides me watching me minister to them and the only thing that really brought me back into just one was fear because as I was experiencing this I became afraid that I was losing my mind and that's one of the terms so I'm just sharing with you some things from history that's one of the terms that we don't really realize a person is saying when they say he was besides himself that's where that term came from yes I mean, not that it's difficult, nothing wrong with that, because if you continue on what you know, you can do that being courageous, right? Well, there's nothing wrong with being courageous and being of good cheer. And, no, it's nothing wrong with being fearful. It's just a matter of that we want to grow yeah. to the point that we aren't. Well, also, it's a kind of a shock. <laughs> yeah, that, that was very shocking to me when I went through that experience. I don't consider that fear, that shock. And, and, and uh, well, I was fearing I was losing my mind because I, I had never even heard anyone in ministry or any place else ever describe to me what I was experiencing at that time. This is years ago. Since then, it was a book by a very famous man of God. Well, it's in his book, Kenneth Hagin. And he said he was at dinner with his wife and another couple and the Lord impressed it on his heart that he had some things that he wanted him, Kenneth Hagin, to say to this other couple. And he said they went back to their room. They're in a hotel. They were out on some meeting, some meeting. He said he went back to the hotel and he prophesied to this couple for over an hour. And he said while he was prophesying to them, all of a sudden he was besides himself, watching himself prophesy to them. Now that's the only time, that was the first time, not the only time, the first time I ever heard of anything like this. And it was a great relief to me. Because this is several years after I experienced what I experienced. And so I'm not sure, but what, and I'm not sure, I can't say, because I haven't experienced it. But I would believe that God has the ability to snatch you out of that body before it even recognizes one instance of that pain. Yes. <laughs> well, if I'm not making myself clear, I'm coming across as though feeling fear makes you a bad person. I, I didn't say that. I didn't mean that. And I don't mean that. I don't mean that feeling fear, I'm just reading the scripture here that says in verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. So there had to be fear there for it to be cast out. So if I'm saying, or it sounds like I'm saying, that being fearful makes a person bad, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that we should share with others the love of God the love that can be so strong and when known about it can cast out fear that's what the scripture says it says but cause fear it says there is no fear in love but perfect love casteth out fear so we can share with others how they can get over the fears by knowing about the love of God it doesn't say that well that's that's I'm still not making myself clear. The perfect love is his love for us that cast out fear. It's not my love for him. We said that in, 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 in verse 10. The perfect love that's being spoken of here is his love for us. If we can receive his love for us, his love for us will cast out fear out of our lives. I'm not talking, if I made it sound like it, that I want you to know for sure, I'm not talking about having fear making you a bad person, and I'm not talking about your love. I'm talking about the love of God. God's love for us. This is what we want to reach out and share with other people. God's love for us will cast out the fear. 
It's not our love for him. We just went over the definition. That's not love. So what we're talking about is God's love for us. And when we get a knowledge of this love for us, it'll cast out fear that causes a lot of our behavior to be wrong. Did you hear what I said? When we know his love for us, we have a knowledge of his love for us, it will cause us to change our actions because of the knowledge that we have of his love for us. So let's go back to, where was that, Second Peter, chapter 1. <clears throat> and we'll start reading in verse 3. Well, verse 2 again. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. It says his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And then it tells us how he has given, used his divine power to give us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And that's through the knowledge of him. The knowledge of his love for us. Do you see that? Hereby are given to, unto us. <clears throat> well, no, verse 3 again. According to his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain to, God, to life and godliness. How? How did you give us all things that pertain to life and godliness? Through the knowledge of him. They called us the glory and virtue through the knowledge of his love for us. That's how we receive it. We don't look to earn it. That's how we receive the grace of God, the favor of God, the mercy of God. How? I have a knowledge of how much he loves me. He loves me so much he sacrificed Jesus for me. Why would he not freely give us all things after sacrificing Jesus? I sacrificed Jesus for you, but that car is too much? That home is too much? That healing is too much? I wouldn't give you a home, but I'll kill Jesus for you. What are we saying? It sounds like we turn God into a schizophrenic. He thinks more of a house than he does of Jesus? What's a thousand houses compared to Jesus? Or a thousand worlds? He's given us that that was priceless. And so, here's what, here's what we're talking about, changing a person's actions. This is why the church has been deceived into this hellfire and brimstone. Like we have to go out and we have to get these people to stop sinning and we have to get them to stop doing this and stop doing that. When it tells us that if we know the love of God, the, when the person knows the love, when we know the love of God, it will change our actions. It says in verse 4, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. The corruption that is in the world through lust. How do you escape it? Through the knowledge of God. Once you start seeing how much he loves you, it says, once you know these exceeding great and precious promises. The great and precious promises. Once you start to study his word and get a knowledge of his word and understand what these great and precious promises are, <clears throat> let's look at one of those in, in Isaiah, one that comes to mind, Isaiah chapter 54. It says exceeding great and precious promises. That means that you find a great and precious promise in God's word, we've been given something that exceeds those great and precious promises. That's Jesus. 
every promise in here that you can find, we've been given something that exceeds it, and that's Jesus. Exceeding great and precious. There are great and precious promises in here. This is one we'll look at in Isaiah chapter 54, and we'll look at it in verse 9. It says, For this is as the waters of Noah unto me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go forth over the earth. Now we're, most of the church is familiar with the fact that God said he wasn't going to wipe out the, the earth with the flood again. Is that right? What, what, how do we know? What's the sign of that? The rainbow. The rainbow is the sign of that. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> so now, that being true, the rainbow is the sign that God said in his promise that never the waters would never, it never let us serve, be flooded again. Why is it that most of the church don't know the rest of this scripture? Without putting you on the spot, do you happen to know what the rest of the scripture says? What the rest of the scripture says is a promise to us? It's the two of them are right here together. This is in the same verse in the same scripture. See, we have a knowledge generally as a church what this is. You happen to know? Yeah. Isn't this something that the, the church in general don't know this? This is a great and precious promise. But hellfire and brimstone teaching is why we don't have a knowledge of this. So let's read the whole scripture. For this is as the waters of Noah unto me, for as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go forth over the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be wroth with thee, nor rebuke thee. I wonder if he is telling the truth. Let's read it in the Amplified Bible and see. For this is like the days of Noah to me, as I swore that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I will not be angry with you or rebuke you. Now how can we go out telling people God's mad at them? Where did we get that from? And if you stop and think about it, there's shining that big bright spotlight into this little dark room. Where does God show that he was angry with man? After the flood. Where does he show that he was angry with man? It's human logic. It's human logic. That we're thinking from our perspective, not from his perspective. You're right. He has to be angry after. You see what those people did? God has to be. That's, that's human logic, right? Yeah. Well, human logic would never sacrifice Jesus for us. Right. You got one good, one bad. So you're going to kill the good one to get the bad one. That's what human logic would say, wouldn't it? No, it's, hey, no, let's kill the bad ones. But what scriptures do we have showing God was angry with mankind? He said, I won't even rebuke you. He hates sin. What did Jesus tell us? This was before Jesus went to Calvary. Jesus said, my father loves you as much as he loves me. But do we listen to those or do we listen to the hellfire brimstone teachers who went in here and found some things where God was punishing sin and being true to his word under the law? You know, it's some scripture that seems very, but let's go back, let's go, let's go back to Peter. I don't want to get off. That also says how uh, He's not going to you up. Oh, that verse 10. I, I'm glad you brought that up. That's good. We'll, we'll read that. This says, For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, 
But my kindness shall not depart from thee, neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord, that has mercy on thee. The covenant of my peace, we just read over there in Second Peter, it says, grace and peace be multiplied to you, not added. Added is something you don't have. The grace and peace that we have is now being multiplied. I like multiplication. Grace and peace. What peace? This peace that he's talking about right here. He said, you can take the hills and stuff, everything. Well, these hills and mountains aren't going to be removed in the not, not in the natural. Man is big, but he isn't that big. Where are you going to put it? What are you going to do with a mountain if you move it? And that's one mountain. He's saying here, he says, For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee. Neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord, that has mercy on thee. This is learning about the goodness of God. It's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. It's through the knowledge of God did we escape the corruption that is in the world through lust? Lust is a pressure, a lusting for money. Why? Because you have a fear you're not going to get enough. You don't have enough. A lusting for things, this pressure that's put on a person. And he says, if you get the knowledge of me, you can escape that pressure. You can escape that lust. You can escape the corruption that is caused by that pressure and that lust. Why? Because you'll know that I love you. I sent my son for you. I spared not my own son for you. And, and now in light of that, that if, I just feel we need to go back to Romans. We'll go back to Second Peter, but let's go back to Romans 8 again. And we'll start reading. <clears throat> we'll start reading in verse 32 again. It says, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? How can we, how can we, how can we take the scripture and I don't even know what you'd say. How, how can we trivialize it? Just one scripture. He said again, I sacrifice my son for you. My only begotten son. The son of my love. I sacrificed him for you. He says, now how can you think I wouldn't freely give you all things. What, what compares? What's more than, what's more precious than what he's already given us? I mean, yeah. Satan has done a number in getting the church to trivialize what God has done. We'll see a scripture. I don't know if we can get to it in this hour or not, but I can show you scriptures here in the book of Romans that God went to great lengths to prove that he himself is still righteous because he did not punish men for the sins that they were committing. He had to prove that he himself is righteous. And the way he did it, we read in the scriptures, but I don't know if we ever look at the gravity of it. It seems so as I've heard someone tell me here quite a few times recently, it seems so theological. But whether it seems theological or not is true. The lengths that God had to go through to prove that he loved us and still at the same time prove that he's still good, that he's still righteous. So we can see that, and I don't know if we'll get to it in this hour, but it's right here in the book of Romans. Verse 32 again. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? That's a question that we as a church should answer. 
who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who's going to bring a railing accusation against you? That's what righteousness means. When you're righteous in the eyes of God, no one can come to God and tell him anything bad about you. He will not give them audience. That's what it means to be righteous. You're right with once you're right with God, no one can accuse you of anything. You're righteous in the eyes of God. You're righteous. And to do that, he had to prove himself to be righteous. But we're talking about his love. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. There it is again. Yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Every time we're accused or would to be accused by Satan, Jesus is sitting right there at the right hand of the Father. All he'd have to do is show him his nail-scarred hands. Father, I died for that. Father, I paid the price for that. He's interceding. The whole anger and wrath of God that I deserve went on my Lord and my Savior. No one can bring, that's what the scripture says, a railing accusation against me because Jesus paid for all of my sins. Everything I did wrong. God placed the punishment for it on Jesus. Everything I'm going to do wrong, God has already punished Jesus for it. What an awesome thought that before I did it, God punished Jesus. How awesome is that? Can you imagine? You have two children. And one of them is going to do something wrong tomorrow. So you take and you punish the good one? What kind of thinking is that? It's not the way man thinks. This is not contrived of man. Man would never have conceived of punishing 2,000 years before I committed the sin, punishing the son of his love for it. And then he goes and he tells us things like this. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? So tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded, this is what I want to be. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor heights, nor depths, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I don't care what it is. God's not going to stop loving me. Because I receive his love in and through Christ Jesus. Oh, what kind of love is this? Yes. No, God punished Jesus. God sacrificed his son. The devil had no power to come to the second person of the Godhead and take his life. Jesus said, no man takes my life. He said, my father has given me the power to lay my life down, and he's given me the power to pick it back up again. God punished his son. He made, just think if Satan could punish, could kill God. Remember, Jesus is all man and all God. Only God had the power to do what.
what he did. And that's when Jesus agreed to do it. Think about it. Think about what actually happened. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's praying. He's in anguish. He said, Father, if there be any... He's not consulting with Satan. He said, Father, if there be any other way. But first he set his father up. He said, Father, all things are possible with you. So whatever I ask you from here on, I know it's possible. Why? Because all things are possible for you. So then, Father, since all things are possible for you, if there be any other way, could there have been another way? If all things are possible. Thank you, Jesus. He didn't stop there. He said, nevertheless, not my will. These, this wasn't done to satisfy Satan. See, this, this is, is, is when the scripture says, had Satan known, had the demons known, they would have never killed the Son of Glory. They wouldn't have done it. Why? Because it was their utter, total defeat. When God allowed them to do that, that was God giving them permission to do it. But they had no idea what was being done when Jesus was sacrificed. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing. But how many people believe that when they mess up, God's angry with them? Now, how can we study this and see this in the Word without having some desire to reach out to others and let them know that God loves them. And that this isn't about religion, this isn't about going to church, this isn't about filling quotas, this is about sharing the love of God. We're co-laborers with our Lord Jesus. We're co-laborers with God in the ministry of our Lord Jesus. And his ministry was to let the world know that God loved them as much as they love as much as he loved Jesus. And so with that we're gonna to have to end this hour. And so until next time, this is Pastor Stewart signing off. Glory to God.